so my charge was, was for us, and I will um, diverge from that a little bit um, at certain times, but I, I hope to bring to you a perspective from the top of the mountain up in Frostburg, Maryland, where I've, I've worked for the last um, 12 years, even though now I'm in Annapolis, as you just heard. Um, you know, forests are a, uh, of course, why, why would we study forests? Well, the first answer is is that over half of, of Maryland, for example, is forested, or at least is under some sort of a tree canopy. Um, I got this off the DNR website. I thought it was an interesting graphic. Um, and I think that a lot of people don't quite realize that. Now, if you think about the loadings of nutrients to the Chesapeake Bay, I'm going to assume that everyone here understands that nutrients to the Chesapeake Bay is a problem. Um, so if you think about loading to the, to the bay, if you're going to put um, five units on that forest, right, and that, and that five units of nutrients goes into the, into the bay, that's going to be equivalent to putting, say, you know, uh, seven or ten units on the, on the other part, some of, maybe the agriculture or the low part. So I'm not saying that those are the units, but the, the point is, is that a little change in forest can have a big change in the Chesapeake Bay because of the fact that it's so much area, right? So why do, why, why do we want to conserve forests? Well, of course, forests are um, important for water quality. So on the left here, we see a graph that shows the percent forest along the x-axis from low on the left to high on the right. And the vertical axis on either side are different ways of measuring nitrogen, right? Total nitrogen and nitrate. So we can see that this is a national survey across the entire United States. A lot of variability there. But you can see that as we increase forest area and watersheds, we, we reduce um, the amount of nitrogen that's coming out of those streams. Um, the, the, you also see a lot of variability there, right? So even at the high end there where there's a lot of forest, we see that there's a fair bit of variability in um, how much of this nitrogen, in this case, total nitrogen or, nit or total nitrogen here, is coming out of this, out of this watershed. So a lot of the talk is going to be about what, what is the source of that, that variability. But I also want to flip it on its head and say, well, the opposite, in some cases, of forest is impervious surface, right? And many of us have to deal with this. This is a really interesting um, study by Scott Stranko at DNR and others. Uh, if you're not aware of it, I, I, would, I hope to be able to inform you here that just really small amounts of impervious surface area can impact the habitat for brook trout, right? And so we have um, here it's just at 2.5% in, in, a, in a watershed in western Maryland. So when we're talking about impervious surface area. This is just one piece of evidence that, that really small amounts can have an impact um, on, on habitat. This is also an example of, of the difference between an UMC's um, graduate student's preparation of a figure and an EPA hydrologist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like the fishes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what, what about forests? We t you know, over half of Maryland is forested, and, and that number even increases when you look at the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed. What, um, what we're going to talk about today is variability in, in, in these forests over space and time and how they've delivered nutrients to the Chesapeake Bay. And we're going to look at two different stressors, one being urbanization here, um, which isn't going to be as tightly tied to the nutrient story, but I think it's an interesting story. And then, of course, um, climate change and warming, and how is warming influencing the um, the, uh, the delivery of nutrients from forests to the bay. So one thing to look at is this is a recent study um, that shows the um, sources of, of nitrogen by watershed across the entire United States. And um, you know, the, the green ones are, are, are fertilizers, right? And so you can see the Corn Belt here throughout the, um, the central part of the United States is the primary um, delivery of nutrients. We can see manure here. There's hot pot spots of nutrients coming from manure, including right here you see some brown right there in Maryland, right? And, you, and you've got um, uh, atmospheric deposition, which comes from the burning of, of coal and other fossil fuels that deposited out in, um, in rainfall and, and also dry deposition. So I think it's really interesting. Maryland really is the combination of all three of these. Um, <laughs> we've got it all going on here. Triple whammy. Yeah. Um, but, but I also really want to point out this, for, for the first part of this talk, this, this blue area here. Okay, This is the atmospheric deposition re region. Why is that area dominated by atmospheric deposition? First of all is, is all the coal-fired power plants in the Midwest, the Ohio River Valley. That air flows over us and, and comes out again in, in dust and rain. 
The other part of it is, is that there aren't really any other sources of nutrients. This is a, largely a forested landscape, and uh, we're not fertilizing forests currently, right? And so the, that nutrients that comes out in rain um, makes it into the, um, into the streams eventually. So what, what's happening to, with that? So um, interestingly, um, we have the Clean Air Act, right? And then in the 1990s, we kind of doubled down on that and uh, with the Clean Air Act amendments and a few other pieces of legislation to regulate acid rain, right? Part of acid rain is nitric acid, which is, it has nitrogen in it, which causes, which is a nutrient, which comes out in streams. So one of the things that we've seen, though, is that since the 1990s and really since the early 2000s, we started to see major reductions in the amount of um, um, deposition. And so across the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed, we have a 35% reduction in nitrogen deposition. So that's really reducing the amount of nitrogen that's coming out of these forested watersheds. I remember really well, actually, one of my first faculty meetings at the Appalachian Lab. Um, we were talking about different things that, uh, you know, we're just going around the room talking about different um, research programs we think would be interesting to work on. One of the faculty, Mark Castro, got really animated. And if you know Mark Castro at all, you know he's not really an animated guy. But he got really animated because he said, I'm starting to see reductions in mercury. Um, in my, and and this, is, this is huge because these Clear Act amendments are, are, are the cause, I'm sure of it. And we're going to start seeing improvements in other constituents, and we should be ready. We need to be ready. We need to have long-term monitoring in place so that we can track this. Well, the person who really listened to him was Keith Eshelman. Keith um, has been working up at the Appalachian Lab for many years, um, at least 10 or 15 more than me. Um, and so he had some long-term records. Now, this one is actually the Potomac River at Hancock, so it's not his data exactly. But um, what we're seeing is it's a long-term decline in the amount of nitrogen coming out of these forested watersheds. So if you know anything about the Potomac River above Hancock, it's mostly forested, right? And so you can see our, that faculty meeting. We're sitting here in the early 2000s. We're start, you know, it's, what he was talking about then was all this variability, and that variability was due to gypsy moth outbreaks. So when the gypsy moths defoliate the trees, that it, the, he was seeing these pulses of nitrate coming out of these small watersheds. That was an interesting story, and it told us that there was a lot of variability again in space and time in the amount of nitrogen that comes out of forested watersheds. But then, starting around then, we started seeing consistent increase or decrease is in, in, in uh, nitrate coming out of, of the Potomac and other small watersheds, and small watersheds, I'm sorry, throughout the region. And he's written us several papers here with his graduate student, Robert Sabo, to show that this is really closely linked to these Clear, Act, Clear, Air, Clear Air Act amendments, Clean Air Act amendments. So one of the things we're seeing here is that forests are releasing less nitrogen, and part of it is due to clean air. Okay, so with that in your back pocket for, for long-term trends, let's, let's look at some other things that are happening around the watershed. One of these things has to do with urbanization and its effect on streams. Um, I, I took an interest in this um, several years ago because one of my colleagues said, well, can you see streams from space? And you know, I'm a remote sensing scientist, and I said, well, you know, sometimes you can. Um, well, so he says, well, I think they're disappearing because we're putting them into storm drains and they're going under cities. So can we, can we track that? And so we did that. So here's, here's an example, 1975, 1990, 2001, 2006. The gray is impervious surface area. We had to go through and make a new map of, of streams. Now, the, the stream map you get from the USGS is not complete, right? So we made a new map of streams that was parameterized with data we collected from forested regions. We figured out what were the topographic characteristics that formed a stream and forests, and then we applied those to the entire state west of the Chesapeake Bay. And what we were able to do, and in parts of Virginia as well as this thing is, um, what we were able to do is show how many of these streams are getting buried by development. And so we use a, a probability um, here to express that. So the blue ones have a low probability of burial, orange is higher, and the red are the highest. Oops. So you can see here there's obviously increasing over time. We've done this for different portions of, uh, of, of Maryland, different watersheds or different cities. And here you can see that we see a very consistent pattern that small streams are generally buried more often than large streams. That makes sense. They're easier to bury, right? It's cheaper to put them in a culvert. We also found, though, that there's this peak right here. And that comes up because these small streams are also really steep. And so they're not usually places that people want to build or 
they, the land prices have to be higher before somebody would build there. So it, as you move from really small streams to larger streams, you see an increase as the streams start to flatten out. And then when you get to the peak, that's where the stream is both small and on flat ground, so it's easy to put into a culvert and is affordable, and so people do it more often. Up to 50% of, of all streams in Baltimore City have been buried at that stream size. And then as streams get larger, this starts to go down as streams essentially get more expensive to bury. So we've seen this pattern in every watershed in Maryland, in every jurisdiction. There's slight variations. The main variations are the steepness of these different slopes. Sorry, this thing's annoying. And the um, and and where this peak is, it tends to move to the right as you increase the level of development. So we've. Um, we, we've got a lot of mileage out of this. We really enjoy looking at these maps and characterizing these different things. But one of the things we've done is we've put it all online in something called the streammapper.al.umsees.edu. You can go here and it uses the Google Earth engine to look at our stream map. You can drill down and see where these streams um, either are or were. Um, in most cases, so again, this, these are, it's kind of like a flow line mapping, but we've, we've tuned each of these streams to, to be as long as we expected it to be if that ba basin were all forested. So it's like at the potential stream density, essentially. Okay, that's what I like to call it. So if you go in here, you can see what, how big this, the stream network could have been if we hadn't developed the entire region. And we can see how many of these streams are protected by riparian corridors and how many of them have been put into stream, into storm drains in a very consistent way over this entire region here. Wow. Um, if you click one other piece of advertisement, if you click here, you can also get information on what our projected um, biodiversity and the species list is for each of those streams. So this is also useful. So if there's, if there's a buried stream, a stream that's in a storm drain, you can click there and it'll, it'll give a prediction of what would be there if it hadn't been buried, so which might be useful for maybe restoration or daylighting if you're thinking, well, I wonder what we might get out of that. Um, okay, so now let's talk about forests and how they're changing with, with climate change. There's two parts of this. There's the warming part of it, which has obviously been very rapid over the last, over, over my, last, my lifetime, right? Um, you know, this is, a, this is a period of the most rapid um, warming that humanity has seen. This is some of the, um, and this is also a period where we have great instrumental records, right? We can use satellite data to look over that period and, and other observational records. The second part of it is the direct effects of CO2. Carbon dioxide is a fertilizer for trees. It's a fertilizer for plants. How is that impacting the, um, the, the growth and, and, uh, uh, and, and um, ability to hold on to nitrogen or not in these watersheds? Okay, well, on land, one of the biggest things of warming is, is an earlier growing season and a longer growing season, right? And so some of us like to go see the cherry blossoms in, in D.C. Well, it, you can get data right off the um, Park Service website and see that those, um, those blossoms are coming earlier. Um, this, and they also are um, so yeah, consistently earlier, and they can predict that. The, I just heard on the radio, they were, they were, they were talking about it just a, a month ago, and um, it's, a, it's a regular occurrence that we've come to accept to some, to, to some degree. In forests um, around the mid-Atlantic, we can use satellite imagery to study the, um, both the average date of the onset of greenness, we call it, like when, when leaves appear on trees, but we can also track that over time. Okay, so this, this map here is the average. We've taken all the available satellite data and we've, um, we've uh, you know, by using the entire record, we get an average date that, the, that that greenness occurred, right? So some of the cool patterns we see here, um, all the color is just forest, right? And so you can see this is the Potomac River right through here. This is the Chesapeake Bay main stem. This is Baltimore and this is DC. You can see the first thing is that he's got these kind of red high halos around the big cities, right? So that's your urban heat island effect. All that impervious surface heats up the, um, the environment which causes the trees to um, leaf out earlier. There's also a, an, an unknown effect that you know, people plant different trees in these regions, and so it may be that those trees are just naturally leaf out earlier. But it's a, obviously a very consistent pattern that the, around these cities. The second one has to do with distance to tidal water. It's mostly seen right down in here along the Potomac, that essentially the, 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 the heat from water in spring 
um, and, well, and, and in the fall actually allows this, this system to um, prolong the growing season a little bit, right? So red is the longer growing season, um, both around cities and near the tidal water here. And then the final one is with elevation, right? So this is the Blue Ridge up at Catoctin Mountain. You see that that has a much shorter growing season. Obviously, at higher elevations, it's cooler, and so you get a shorter growing season. So this tells us a lot about the landscape controls on growing season length in forests. But what we'd like to do is drill down through this and look at changes over time as well, right? So we've done that. This is, again, from satellite data, but only for a selection of sites um, throughout the Mid-Atlantic. Some of the, these are all from national parks, um, Prince William and uh, Catoctin Mountain, for example. But when we do this, we see that um, the spring anomaly, right, so this is um, distance from that mean image you saw in days, has, has tracked from being um, relatively late, being a positive anomaly, being that would be a later spring uh, um, emergence of leaves, to, to an earlier one here. And this is lots of variability, obviously, but this is trending earlier over time. So one of the things that we work on is like, well, what is this? How does this impact the um, the growth of trees and their and their availability to, their ability to get nutrients, right? So earlier springs, a longer growing season might, in fact, um, allow the trees to grow faster, right? They have um, a longer period, a longer warmer period to um, perform photosynthesis and and put on wood in, in the form of tree rings. So it might be that we would get um, more production out of these trees and that be better, right? On the other hand, um, an earlier spring might mean that the tree uses up the nutrients it has in the soil, and it and it essentially um, is uh, nitrogen, for example, would become less uh, available to that tree, and and therefore we wouldn't get that same growth spurt because you know you have to have some of everything for the tree to grow. So what we do to, to ask these questions and study them is use tree rings. Um, we core the trees, and then we go through here. We measure the ring width, yes, but we also cut each of those rings off, and we do chemistry on the rings to figure out um, what the availability of nitrogen was to the tree in each year. And so then the question is, is, like, was, is the availability of nitrogen higher or lower to the tree in the year of an earlier spring? Right? So we do that, and, and I'm not, I slipped out of the slides to kind of talk about the analytical method and how you go about that. But what we find is that earlier springs are related to reduced nitrogen availability. Okay, so we're using something here called the uh, isotopic method, or isotopic ratio of nitrogen. But the point is, is that when this number is higher, nitrogen is more available. And when this number is lower, nitrogen is less available. And this is our spring anomaly here, right? Remember, negative was what's happening more recently. Negative is the, is the earlier spring. So when you have earlier springs, we have less available nitrogen, we have a lower um, nitrogen uh, availability index, and when when springs are, are later, which um, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, when springs were later in the past, we had more nitrogen availability. Now, what's really interesting, we do see trends in nitrogen availability related to the atmospheric deposition story I mentioned and other factors I can talk about in a minute. But for these trees in this place, the, um, the timing of spring explained most of the variability in, uh, in, in nitrogen availability. So the timing of spring has a really strong control on how much nitrogen comes out in streams. And I will make it the link back to the streams in a second here. Okay, so one of the other things we can do is remember we're, we're using remote sensing, right? And the remote sensing is, is, is not just measuring the springtime, it's measuring the, the canopy cover all year round, right? And so this is a typical phenology curve, we call it, right? This is the, this is the amount of vegetation in a forested canopy by day of year. And so it's flat here and then it increases that spring. And then what we always see is this kind of decline throughout the summer, right? As the, as the photosynthetic machinery in the leaves starts to break down. And then you have the autumn senescence, right? This is when the leaf fall occurs. Well, when we look at the residuals to this, that means how far these individual measurements in gray are from this average line over time, over years, we see that um, before the year 2000, when we were having mostly later springs, um, we, we, we get that browner spring, right? Because the spring hasn't happened yet, so the, the residuals are negative. But we get a greener later summer. This is day 220. This is about the middle of the summer. Whereas when we have those early springs, 
springs, we get that nice green spring, but it's, it's sort of a browner autumn. And so what we're seeing is that correlated with the nitrogen availability story, these trees are, are browner in the later part of the summer. And so a lot of people say, oh yeah, I've noticed that. Like the trees just aren't quite as green in the later part of the summer as they used to be. Well, we think that that's all, we're seeing it in the remote sensing record and we think it's tied in with that nitrogen availability story. Earlier springs related to reduced nitrogen availability is leading to browner autumns, or browner late summers even. So, Earlier springs are not necessarily associated with faster forest growth. What we're seeing is that springs are coming earlier. We're seeing this in a variety of habitats, forested habitats, but that earlier springs are associated with this reduced nitrogen availability and that they're also associated with this decline in canopy cover. So we, we do see a little bump in, in the total production out of the forest with a longer growing season, but it's not nearly as big as you would expect and it's tied in with this nitrogen story. Well, we've started to look at other parts of the world, and, or the United States and then the world. Um, this is work with Kendra McLaughlin. She cored trees all across the United States. The green are forests, and the dots are our, our, um, our, our, our coring sites. And when we plot all of those up, this, this data was not done in a way that we can uh, match that up against the, the timing of spring. But again, the nitrogen availability here is going down. We're seeing that across forests, across the United States, nitrogen availability is just ratcheting downward um, since 1850 in this case, right? So the, these, these cores were measured all the way back, not just over the remote sensing record. So what she says in her paper is that this is due to um, rising atmospheric CO2. That essentially as you um, increase atmospheric CO2, there's a, um, it's either through um, photosynthetic downregulation, which means that the plant essentially doesn't need to invest as much nitrogen in the leaves, therefore it, because it's getting so much carbon dioxide, it doesn't need to invest as much in nitrogen, so it allows um, the nitrogen concentration to go down. Once that lower leaf, lower quality leaf litter hits the forest floor and decomposes, it releases less nitrogen to the tree in the next year. And over time, you get progressive nitrogen um, limitation. There's other people that disagree on the exact mechanisms and we could go into that, but the fact of the matter is is that through the combination of earlier springs, rising CO2, and reductions in atmospheric deposition, these forests are becoming um, more nitrogen limited, if you will, or there's a decline in nitrogen availability. When we make a map of this, we can um, correlate these trends with different climate parameters and we can make a map to show that these trends are strongest in the, in the mid-Atlantic and in the Northeast and in the Northwest. So those are the areas where that trend in nitrogen availability is most negative. In the red areas are areas where it's, it's more positive. We took this recently one step further and we looked at a global database of leaves and we measured this nitrogen availability index in, in, um, in all of these leaves. These leaves are all collected since 1980, so we can look at trends globally since 1980. And we find that, um, in fact, uh, nitrogen availability is declining as, as measured in the leaves as well. So it's not just the ringwood, but also in the leaves. This is the, the, the nitrogen availability, ind availability index. You can see that it's declining through here. Um, this is also the amount of nitrogen in the leaf. Just the concentration of nitrogen in the leaf is declining as well. This is quite alarming because nitrogen in leaves is, is the building blocks of, of the whole uh, food chain, right? I mean, nitrogen is, is necessary for protein synthesis. Insects are eating leaves, birds are eating insects, um, my cat's eating the birds. You, you've got, you, we, there's, there's a chain here that's all based on how much nitrogen is in those leaves. It's, that it's declining here could have widespread implications for wildlife on Earth. Bringing it back to streams, um, Robert Sabo, a student at AL, is, has been look, coring trees and matching up individual years that he gets um, this nitrogen availability index from the, from the tree ringwood to small watershed nitrate export. And so this is done, this is painstaking work that requires a lot of coring, right? But here's, here's work that he did at Payne Run in the Shenandoah. Each of these watersheds has a different average 
um, nitrogen availability from the ringwood. That's like taking the entire tree ring and grinding it up and measuring how much, um, how, what the nitrogen availability of that tree is. And he sees that it correlates pretty well between watersheds, okay? So trees that have that high nitrogen, higher nitrogen availability index tend to release more nitrogen to, to streams than, than the ones that have a lower nitrogen availability index. And then when he looks across time, he sees the same thing. So the, each of these um, lines represents another watershed, a small watershed where he's cored the trees and he's matched up those ring winds, re, the, the ring chemistry against the um, nitrate export and streams, and he sees that they're correlated as well. But there's a sort of a different model for every watershed. So I show this slide to show that I'm not just um, just uh, you know, spitballing when I'm talking about um, uh, reduced nitrogen availability in, in tree rings, and that's going to have implications for the Chesapeake Bay. We're actually starting to tie these things together. We can see that, in, at least in these small watersheds, there's a relationship between what we're measuring in terms of the nitrogen status of trees and forests and what actually comes out of these watersheds and makes it way down to the bay. So this leaves us with a, a situation where we, we have to keep two different things in our mind at the same time, and that's always really challenging. Um, on the, in the one hand, this story is still true, okay? Agriculture, for example, is the main culprit, produces, a, puts a ton of, um, uh, fertilizer on fields. We've got animal manure. These are huge fluxes of nitrogen and phosphorus to um, to the land and ultimately to streams and to the bay. And so that's represented by these really big arrows here. That story is still true. I'm not going to deny that that's happening. But on the other hand, we have forested watersheds that are just releasing just a small amount of, of nitrogen to the to the bay, and that number is decreasing. When Keith Eshelman was was studying the effects of gypsy moth um, on nitrate export, you know he saw this little blip, but then it flattened out. Well, we haven't had a lot of, of gypsy moth outbreaks um, recently, and so there hasn't been a lot of these fluxes of nitrogen coming out of forested watersheds. This number up here, the, the deposition is equal. On, it comes down on, on farm fields or on forests, but it's decreasing over time as well. Rising CO2 is happening in both places. So essentially, these little trends here, these trend lines show what, you know, we're seeing a decrease in nitrogen availability. We're seeing a decrease in, in stream nitrate coming out of um, forested watersheds. But we're seeing an increase in the amount of fertilizer applied. And well, maybe not everywhere, but we're seeing nitrate um, in, in, where, that, where, those, where it's being increasing in fertilizer, you're seeing more nitrate come out. So finally, um, just to summarize, these are some of the things we're observing in forests. I would say that, the, you know, the, I was told just a minute ago, what, what does it mean for you? I would say what it means the most is that um, forests uh, have more value now than ever before. They're releasing less nitrogen than they've ever released before um, in the Chesapeake Bay, so watershed. And so if you had a motivation before to conserve forests, you probably have a stronger one now because the leverage that they have on the, on the system and the amount of um, nutrients making it out to the bay is, is, is more now than in the past. It also means that if you're trying to measure the effectiveness of another best management practice, you have to keep in your mind that the forest in your watershed are trending downwards, right? So they're exerting an improving trend that you don't want to misassociate with something else. Thanks. Questions? Yeah. Have you all looked at the age of forest and, and um um, so the the question was, um, does the age of the forest influence the um, the, uh, the my results? I guess in terms of the uh, how much nitrogen is coming out of these streams. Now the the. We, we only core older trees that give us a longer record, and so that's true. We're, we're, we're using those older trees as sort of sentinels that allow us to um, track those changes over time. The um, younger forests will, I mean, if you have like a timber harvest event, it will release more nitrogen um, in it for a, for a period of time. But, you know, the work on that generally shows that that starts to flatten out over time. And so, um, 
while we are continuing to do forest harvest practices that will influence how much nitrogen comes out of the forest, um, there is a lot of older forests out there, and we're, you know, especially on private lands, that really isn't being harvested. And those, those forests are, are actually very similar to sort of our national parks in a lot of ways. Yep. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you.